First of all, uh, just a quick overview of the program. Um, as I said, my name is Marit Schnepp from the Europa Federation and together with Christian Pjornstad, who is the head of the Nature Regional Landscape Parks Task Force, we will give a quick introduction to the topic and then we are moving straight into uh, three super exciting presentations on the topic of dark skies, light pollution, and how we can reduce this to benefit nature, including us humans. Our first presenter will be Manon Butor from a French NGO um, who is working on special initiatives on dark skies. And she will present different initiatives and how they have benefited uh, nature uh, and yeah, nature in the different parks um, and give us some insights into that topic. Um, our second speaker is Daniel Kliedner from the Naturpark in Ur. He's a technical expert in lights and uh, has a background in electrical engineering. He has joined the Naturpark Ur in 2019. So he will give us some insights into the more yeah, lightning solutions that a park uh, could implement to improve the lightning situation. And our last speaker is Sean Francois Crawford from the, um, he's a delegate of Dark Sky International and the co-founder of Dark Sky France chapter. And he's an astrophotographer, uh, so also super exciting to give us some insights into the certification program for Dark Sky parks or uh, communities. So yeah, with that, um, just to keep you, uh, on hold a little bit longer before we get into these presentations. Just some very basic uh, information on the webinar. Of course, we are recording this webinar, as you have noticed. That means the recording is available after the webinar it will be shared. It's online on our website, um, as well as all the presentations. So you will receive that. Um, feel free to close or open your camera as you wish. It will not be part of your camera will not be part of the recording because we're recording in speakers mode. So that is not an issue, but we're happy to see faces. So please feel free to open your camera. If you have any questions uh, or comments, use the chat uh, and write it there. After each presentation, there will be time for question and answers um, to the speakers. And yeah. Um, what, who who are you or where are you from? Please feel free to write that in the chat so we actually get to know uh, our audience a little bit better and who is here today. Um, just because we also have a few participants who are maybe not familiar with Europark. Uh, Europark is a network for protected areas and parks in Europe. Uh, we are a huge network uh, existing since around 50 years. Um, we have more than 400 members in around 40 countries and this is really our biggest strength we are really stronger together we have a stronger voice uh, for the topics that are of our concern and interest um, we do a lot of knowledge exchanges capacity building learning from each other and yeah representing parks and protected areas also on the policy level in europe um, you can learn more about us if you're not familiar with us yet uh, on the socials or on, on our website. So you're very much invited to join and follow us to learn more. As I mentioned, this webinar is organized by Europe's Nature Regional Landscape Parks Task Force. This is uh, shortly said one of the working groups of Europark. And yeah, on the picture, you can see a few representatives of our group uh, at the last conference. There's more now from different countries. And yeah, nature regional landscape parks are a unique uh, setup of parks. They are rich in biodiversity, working clo closely with people. And there's more than 900 different parks across Europe. That's a huge area and a, a lot of potential. So we are really a nice and huge network actually. And uh, yeah, I invite you to look more into this um, uh, brochure that we have here that illustrates all the different nature regional landscape parks across Europe. And with that, I'm handing over to Christian, uh, who's the head of our task force and who will introduce the topic of dark skies and dark living landscapes, what that actually means and why we have chosen this topic for our webinar. 
um, for a very short introduction before we then hand over to our first uh, speaker. So over to you, Christian. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Marit, and thank you, Jessica, for, uh, for helping us organize this uh, webinar. And uh, hi, everyone. It's good to see that so many joined us uh, today. Um, it is an interesting topic, and I have to say I personally am very engaged in this uh, as well. Um, so, uh, so I'm really happy on the behalf of the Nature Regional Landscape Parks uh, Task Force to be able to welcome you all today. Um, we have some great speakers from uh, France and Luxembourg. Thank you also. Uh, I also have to mention that we do some great works in, our, in the nature parks of Austria, for example, and in, in the national landscapes in, in the UK. So all across Europe, there's some great work uh, on this topic uh, and, and a lot of inspiration for, for those of you who are thinking about uh, working with dark sky and maybe certify your areas or communities. Um, I think we should especially thank the Dark Sky Association or International Dark Sky Association because of their work. And I'm glad that uh, our French speaker is a representative uh, of, of the association. They do a lot of uh, great work uh, all across the world, actually, very important uh, work. And we just got our first uh, International Dark Sky Park in Norway, which I'm very happy about. Uh, I am from Norway. Um, and, and it's the northernmost International Dark Sky Park in the world. It's right up in the subarctic area of Norway. Um, so, uh, well, I'm going to do a little introduction. I'm going to talk a bit about um, how we can support nightlife. I don't mean bars and clubs in that way. I mean the nightlife and the living dark landscapes that we uh, are talking about uh, today. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about why parks and protected areas are important platforms for this type of work. And um, living landscapes, it's, it's the way why we chose that title is because our category of parks are in lived in areas. Um, and especially when, when we look at the parks across Europe, we see that continental Europe uh, with high density of people and also light pollution. So it's, it's kind of natural that uh, a lot of this work has been focused in continental Europe. So I'm gonna show you a little bit uh, a short presentation. Um, Let me see if this works out. I hope so. You can see this, right? Yes, perfect. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So I'm flooded in light uh, this morning here, but uh, I want to go into the darkness a little bit here. And, and this is a picture of, above my house, actually, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, um, and we are fortunate here up in the north to have a lot of darkness, um, which is great. Uh, but... We also have access to a lot of energy, which uh, makes us uh, sort of uh, uh, prone to use a lot of light around our houses. So I wonder sometimes if we, do we really appreciate uh, the darkness that we have around us? And, uh, and I'm really glad that uh, Man Manon is going to talk about how to create awareness because this is something we almost take for granted sometimes, especially for us up, up here in the north. Um, but let me see now. Okay. There we go. Someone who, who does not take this for granted is, is the indigenous people of the north. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this because dark sky is also a heritage. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about technical things about light pollution certification, but remember that the dark sky is also part of a living heritage, and especially for indigenous peoples and minorities. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, is the one of the important stars or signs uh, of the Sami people. You see the moose in the middle? It's Sarve. 
Um, and this is from a southern Sami star sign. In the in the northern Sami, they have reindeer as as their sign. You see the hunter there. Um, he's trying to kill the the moose, but in the way you see the north star. The north star is in the way, and he can't hit the moose. So he needs help from all of his his family and friends that you see around him. You see his two brothers. They are the ones who invented skiing. He tries to kill the moose, but he fails. And he tries every night. And that's how the cosmic powers stay in balance. So it's a really interesting story and also very close to the Sami people, but also I think is a heritage to, to, to protect. Here's another uh, picture. This is from my... Um, from my area and from my region. It's from the region of the forest Finn minority. And we have a Finnish Ugric uh, heritage here. Um, and in, in the Finnish Ugric heritage, uh, the North Star is very important. It sort of holds up the whole universe and the whole universe revolves around the North Star. And the Milky Way is actually, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's where the birds fly to warmer countries. You can imagine that uh, it's cold up here during winter. And, and the Milky Way uh, is where all the birds fly to a warm place. So this is, um, this is uh, part of the heritage. Uh, and I'm sure you can find a lot of uh, local stories, traditional stories about the dark sky in your areas uh, as well. But the problem is that um, this is all threatened. It's threatened by light pollution uh, and it's threatened by satellites. It's, it's being crowded. The universe or the sky is being crowded by satellites. Elon Musk is probably going to put out a lot more satellites in the, in the years ahead now, I, I fear. And actually, it's a good telescopes are a good thing. Uh, it's good for science, but they are also being placed in indigenous areas and in minority areas, large installations. And it's worth thinking about that as well. Uh, so someone, some many are calling this astro-colonialism. It's kind of an interesting uh, term, right? Um, and we're sort of being colonized. The dark sky is being colonized uh, by all these, all these things. And that threatens our connection to the dark sky. So this is something we have to, uh, to work with. And uh, what we can do as parks and protected areas we can invo involve ourselves in dark sky development together with partners like the IDA. And um, I think that we can develop dark sky work in, a, in very holistic uh, ways. Um, and we can do that with parks as a platform for, for this work. And we can have some good returns on this work. We can have some benefits for this work. Of course, we can have the social benefits where we cooperate. Uh, we can throw events and parties like the dark sky week, for example, that's very important. But we can also use dark sky, uh, as I showed you, uh, in interpretation and storytelling. Uh, we can connect with sustainability issues. For example, the Sami story about holistic ways of looking at nature and man, for example, you know? So that could be a very good, uh, a good way to work with, uh, with this. We have financial returns. Um, Astrotourism is a growing, uh, growing field and we can use it in place branding in some dark areas um, can, um, can show that, uh, that these are attractive areas. And of course, Many of you are concerned about nature, protecting uh, nature. And, um, and the dark sky is, of course, very important for birds and wildlife um, and others, other, uh, uh, other species. It's also good for us uh, health-wise with deeper sleep and, and stress reduction. So this, these are ways we can think about this work in more holistic ways. Uh, of course, we are going to talk about special specialists in, in different fields, but remember that 
both the heritage and also the holistic way of looking at it. I think that's the the basics of sort of a more living uh, landscape approach towards dark sky development. And Albert Einstein said it very beautifully. He said that uh, we are a part of the universe, but we as people experience us, ourselves or something separate from the rest. And that is one of the basic problems of our connection with, with nature, I think. So just to go out of, of the darkness now, I'm myself flooded in light this morning, but uh, I just wanted to just uh, quickly repeat a little bit what Marit said, um, that our nature regional landscape parks are excellent areas for this type of work. And as you can see, we are spread across Europe uh, in over 900 areas. Um, and we, in our task force, we, uh, we work together, the national associations work together to, uh, to collaborate on, on different, uh, different issues from landscape, sustainable tourism, um, and also dark sky work. And here we are again. We are a, a great group of uh, people. So if you want to get in touch with us, uh, go to the Europark uh, website, look at our publications, and, and get in touch with us through Europark. So that's my introduction. I hope you uh, have a very good webinar, and, uh, and uh, thank you so far. Thank you very much, Christian. I actually feel like I want to go out to the darkness now and look at the sky. And yeah, I feel like often we don't have that chance anymore because these dark places are missing or they are not in our close environment, at least if we work, if we live in a city or a more populated area. Um, yeah, let's move into our first presentation. And I'm very glad to have here with us Manon Ritor from the French NGO act for the environment. She will say the French name, so I'm not doing that. Um, and she will tell us more about the initiatives they have set up to raise awareness on the topic. And uh, yeah, the Le Jour de la Nuit, for example, that they have started every year. And yeah, she will tell us more about that. And yeah, with this, I'm handing over directly to Manon. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, sorry, share my screen. Thank you very much. Um... So, is it working? Yes, perfectly. Perfect. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And thank you to Europark for welcoming me today. Um, uh, my name is Manon Riotor, and I'm a project officer in a non-profit organization called Agir pour l'Environnement, so the name in French, Act for the Environment. Uh, I have been working for a couple of years on light pollution, but I'm not an expert. Um, and I worked mainly on the implementation of Le Jour de la Nuit, Day of Darkness, um, in English, uh, in France, and I'm really glad to present it to you. Uh, it's just the first time I'm presenting this project in English, and I know that I have very strong French accent, so please, if you don't understand me, <laughs> feel free to ask me or to ask questions at the end. Uh, I won't mind. <laughs> uh, so to begin with, I will just present a little bit my um, my organization so that you know why we are working on light pollution. So Agir pour l'Environnement is a French non-profit organization which aims at raising awareness in France on a wide range of environmental topics, uh, such as the promotion of organic food in schools, preservation of edges, or fight against microplastics. We also release original analysis, such as the impact of tires on the air quality, for instance, the last one we, we released. And in 2000, 2008, uh, we launched Le Jour de la Nuit, uh, which uh, after a huge campaign on Christmas lights, uh, it made quite an impression and it has now become a popular event in France, which takes place every year in October in the country, but also in Quebec now. Uh, the organization is completely independent. So that's it for Agile for Environment. During my presentation, I will say a few words on the impact of light pollution. I know it has already been introduced, so I will be really brief. 
uh, in the second part, I will present you Le Jour de la Nuit, which is our main event. It's not the only event taking part in France, taking place in France, but it's one of the main events around light pollution. And then I will follow up quickly with two case studies of natural box, which went dark in France uh, and implemented uh, raising awareness action and outreach campaigns. So uh, about impacts of light pollution quickly, there are five main reasons to implement new mitigation light mitigation strategies. Uh, first of all, light pollution keeps increasing in the world. So it's a very critical issue because its impact on biodiversity are now well documented. Light pollution plays a major part in the extinction of the insects, but it's often neglected and all the species are concerned. We also know that it has a critical impact on health. It endures the production of melatonin, uh, which can lead to hormonal dependent cancer, obesity, stress and depression. So it has a huge impact. And of course, it causes sleep disturbance. Uh, as we already said, nice sky heritage needs also to be preserved and astronomers find it all the more disturbing that they cannot watch at the sky anymore. It's a good heritage and we need to preserve it. And lastly, um, which is a good argument for cities and local representatives, uh, artificial light has a cost and consume a lot of energy. So in France, it represents 41% of the electric cost in the city. So it's quite important. So all in all, I will just not, I just wrote down some positive outcomes, but we already said it. Um, if we uh, have light pollution mitigation policy, we, we, we could, could have peaceful night, protection of biodiversity, and more important, it can also be an example for all stakeholders, even the private sectors, citizens, and shops, for instance which can understand why we have to, to, to be careful with light pollution at night. So moving on to Le Jour de la Nuit. Le Jour de la Nuit is a special kind of event in France, entirely dedicated to all the issues we raised by light pollution mentioned earlier. It's a national campaign promoted by a dozen of national federations from a wide range of fields, regional national park, natural park, a federation of Astronomers, Educational Network for Biodiversity, uh, Dark Sky Friends, which is there as well. Um, it's addressed to every kind of stakeholders who are related and interested into the promotion of the night and want to raise awareness. So we have uh, cities, local representatives, we have NGOs, job, astronomers, schools. I mean, every uh, everybody actually can uh, implement a Le Jour de la Nuit event on their territories. Um, so how does it work? Every year we dedicate one day and one night to an outreach campaign aiming at raising awareness on these topics. And Agir pour l'environnement, my NGO, coordinates the national promotion and gives to every participant a toolkit, which will then help them organize and promote their events. Uh, in this to toolkit, you can find various support, uh, content, and communication material. And then we also take care of press relations and we create the national dynamic, which helps to, to yes, create this, um, to raise awareness at the national level. Uh, various types of events ranging from total extinction to nature works and artistic events are organized every year. The most common event is a conference followed by a walk to discover the local biodiversity and then an astronomy night with local astronomers, for instance. Um, so just on this slide, I wanted to show you that we give a wide range of communication materials. The poster and logos, which are national, are really useful. And um, we also propose photo exhibition, legal guides, and ideas of animation. Um, I, saw, I saw a question about how we can ask uh, people to, to be careful with the light on, the, on local territories. And we have legal guides which shows that how we can um, ask other people bigger to, to respect the law. And so we, we give, we distribute this kind of tool to every citizen who asks for it. 
so le jour de la nuit uh, is, as you can see, national. We have events everywhere and mostly in natural parks, actually, because it's really a tool that they, that they implement every year. We also have a few events in Quebec and maybe more uh, next year because it's just beginning in Quebec, just the beginning. Um, so Le Jour de la Nuit has had a great impact, especially in natural parks, as I said. And I have to add that it was not the only uh, outreach campaign. We have also a lot of other actions in France. I just focus on this one because um, it's uh, it's it's been here for a while in France and it has really helped to raise awareness, but there were also other initiatives, of course. Um, so we can discuss them further <laughs> at the end, but I will just mainly focus on the Jour de l'année. Uh, I identified three main positive outcomes. So it has been a, a true milestone in order to promote dark skies and to change the usual representation of the night. It helped having a better understanding of local initiatives for citizens, and it was also a tool to promote new, new light mitigation actions. And it helped, secondly, territories to obtain certification and to implement animation in order to promote their action. Thirdly, it was a, a tool for local representatives to promote their initiative, even at a larger scale, because Le Jour de la Nuit is a go belt between national and local level. So we can imagine that when we have um, 1,500 events organized at the same time on a, on a territory, it's a strong incentive to take part to the action and it's easier to open board when there is a global frame. So thanks to that, uh, really, a lot of cities just uh, came to the to the then just went into the din dynamic and began uh, to think about light pollution actions. And really, thank after Le Jour de la Nuit, some, it has been like um, yes, a kickstart for a lot of of territories. So it created a dynamic uh, also at the regional level. We have an have now natural parks in partnership with other stakeholders who dedicate an entire month to light pollution. So in October, uh, in like four territories in France, it's a month dedicated to uh, action on light pollution and also on raising awareness about uh, the beauty of the dark sky. Um, Okay, so I just presented briefly Le Jour de la Nuit. Um, so I would like to emphasize now on three perspectives for this event. Um, we have had testimonies about the fact that it's really difficult to convince shops and the private sector in general uh, into mitigation policies. So we will not try to reach them thanks to this um, outreach campaign and they can also benefit from the movement. We will also love to continue working with uh, other countries. And uh, we have a network of um, several hundred citizens created two years ago. They are entire, entirely ready to take actions on light pollution during the Le Jour de la Nuit. So we give specific tasks to them and it helps us implement a participative science action. Um, to finish with our perspective, um, we know that Le Jour de la Nuit helped us to, to raise awareness to our national representative, but we would also love, love it to, to broaden our, we would also love to broaden our action and to reach um, European representatives. And we want to show them that a coordinate action is possible and that this topic deserves our attention. So for the next edition of Le Jour de la Nuit, I would love to highlight what are other European initiatives to show that we are not alone, that it's a global issues. So please, if you have any, this kind of events in your countries, please feel free to share and to tell me because maybe we can create global uh, action at this moment. The next uh, Jour de la Nuit will be um, on October the 11th next year. So moving on, uh, I would love to present you two case studies 
uh, in natural parks in France. I interviewed them to just to know what kind of action they implemented to raise awareness on light pollution in their territories. So I'm able to give you an insight on when it could what it could mean to implement strategies of light mitigation. Um, I will begin with Le Gatinet Francais. It is close to Paris with one important city with more than 10,000 inhabitants. And yet they managed to have 100% of their cities without public light at night. Only some roads are still with lights, but they not only have a policy of no public light in summer as well, uh, they also have an increasing number of cities who ask to do the same. So cities are asking to shut their light, which is really uh, a good thing. So they are really at the cutting edge concerning light pollution mitigation. That's why I, I chose them. So on the map, you can see that they are really close to Paris, our capital city, and to the suburbs. So they really have problems with light pollution coming from there. So why did they do that? Um, they decided, in short, uh, to, initiate, to initiate a strategy of light reduction when they realized the impact artificial light would have on insects because of a major study which was uh, released a few years ago. They also saw a picture uh, taken from above. Um, and they saw it was really a shock for them because they saw the impact of artificial light on their natural parks. And it was supposed to be protected from any pollution. So they were kind of a problem. In addition to that, they thought about dark sky preservation, money and energy saving, of course, and to a certain extent, they realized that less artificial lights lead to more peaceful nights. So all in all, representatives were very aware of light pollution and willing to do something, which was then um, a good thing to initiate strategies. So how did they do that? They, did it step by step and focused on representative mainly. They furnished help and information and a strong initiative was funding condition to the extinction of public lights on their territory. And among their best practice, they, are, they did works with representatives to discover their city at night and discuss about which lights are useful or useless. And Le Jour de la Nuit, the of Darkness, uh, was also a great uh, way to promote the beauty of dark sky and show citizens that they live in a preserved area. So they created a dynamic on that, thanks to this event. Um, so here's just a small picture to, sh to show the difference between before the extinction, after the extinction. And uh, as impacts, there are impacts on every level for this mitigation policy. They saved money because six hour extinction equals 50% of reduction of the cost of, uh, of on light, which was quite important for them. And on biodiversity, even for, though they don't have any monitoring, citizens feel an improvement on the the biodiversity and they also appreciate the dark sky anyway with an improvement also on the quality of their sleep and health. They also saw that there are more astronomers on their territory which is a good thing even close to Paris. Um, so now we have seen uh, a territory close to a very large city, and now we can move on to the mountains. Um, my second study is located in the International Dark Sky Reserve called Al Pazur Mercanto. So Jean-Francois is going to tell more about International Dark Sky Reserve. So it's just an introduction right now. It is Al Pazur Mercanto is a very large territory close to Nice and a very touristic region in the south of France. They benefit from various ecosystems and different altitudes. And on this territory, we have three different stakeholders working together to obtain a specific 
they obtained already actually the certification basket. And among them, there were two natural rocks. Um, so why did they do that? They realized that there were an increasing amount of light coming from touristic areas. And dark sky in initiatives seemed to be the perfect solution to protect their territory from these um, coming lights, incoming lights. They really had in mind the protection of their heritage um, to preserve the work of astronomers who historically used to come to benefit from their quality of darkness. So it's not exactly the same reason as my first uh, case study because they already had a protected area and just wanted it to keep it to stay the same. Uh, biodiversity was also a strong incentive as they have a lot of species of bats and fireflies, which is quite unique now. So at this moment, strong outreach campaign with, was really important in this territory. It, has, it had a very huge impact as we launched this campaign with a lot of events on the territory. We also implemented an academic program with activities uh, during the academic year. And Le Jour de la Nuit helped them to highlight their action and they even created now the month of the night. As I said earlier, uh, it's Le Jour de la Nuit, but during all the month of October. So every city is organized something to show the quality of their, of, their, uh, of their nights. And it really creates the need. Wait. Uh, I just wanted to say that they also, they used outreach campaign, but they also used formation from, for professional and meeting with all stakeholders to further sharing, sharing of good practices. And they also used the money lo uh, lover with financial help for the renovation. So as a result, 75% um, of their cities shut, shut lights at night and 70% of cities are currently renovating their public. Citizens are truly happy and even ask for more extension and they still participate a lot to animation during the month of the night. So it's still working. Uh, so it's really dynamic on this topic and the feeling of contributing to the preservation of an heritage. Concerning biodiversity, they don't really have um, really numbers, but it's a work in progress and they initiated the monitoring on several spaces and they also can promote the action to natural parks in the neighborhood as well as in Italy, as I saw in the chat. Um, so these two case studies shows that thanks to motivated representative and a group of persons, we can definitely implement new light and dark skies policies with positive outcomes. And we, think we need to include citizens in this dynamic because they are true stakeholders. And all, we also need to always communicate on the benefit of these actions to keep raising awareness on this subject. So a national event is uh, truly uh, uh, helpful for that. So I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope everything was clear. And um, as I said, I'm really glad to present Le Jour de la Nuit, but I'm sure there are other initiatives elsewhere. So I would be glad to, to hear about that. And don't hesitate to reach me and to ask questions. Thank you very much, Mon. <laughs> that was super interesting and a lot of information. And yeah, it's it's great to see how important awareness raising is on the topic and how much is already being done on different levels, not only in France, mm -hmm. but I see that the chat is super active with people sharing oh, on I similar initiatives <laughs> from yeah, from different uh Le Jour in, in different countries. So there is an example from Belgium and also Austria. Um, and the idea to create also something on a similar date, for example. Because so as I understood from your presentation, do you have a same date for Le Jour de Nuit every year, or is it always different? It's always uh, on the second week, so week of October. Ah, okay. So, yeah. yeah. So next year it's going to be on the 11th. It's always a Saturday, actually. Okay, yeah. 
Um, there was a question in the chat about the toolkit, which is super helpful, probably in France to 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 organize these events. Um, and the question is: Is it possible to export the format Sure uh, de la Nuit in Italy? I would really love to read the kit practique. Yes, the so toolkit. everything is in French now, but yeah. it's definitely possible to show what we do, and that's what we did with uh, Quebec. So they adapt our toolkit to their territory in Quebec, so we can definitely share um, what we do and then adapt it to the place. Um, I can send it on the chat maybe so that you can see what we do, of course. Yeah, you can also, we can include the link to the toolkit in the presentation when we share it with the participants. There have been just a, maybe a, one or two more questions from the chat to you. Um, there was a bit of discussion on the security of during dark uh, nights, uh, so when we turn off the lights, uh, how mm. does it affect the security for people? Maybe that's also a question for Daniel in the next uh, presentation from mm. the technical perspective. Um, but do you have any experience from your cases um, of um, how you deal with that? Yeah, none of, none of them talked about security issues. It was even the contrary, as they said, that um, nights were more peaceful and there were less material degradation, for instance. So, of course, because there are less lights, um, there are less people in the street So and material degradation. But it's really specific to this. Uh, it was in Le Gatinet Francais, for instance, for, for that. But I, I don't have a national... Um, um, studies showing what are the impacts. I just know that I've never had any negative impacts mm. coming from yeah. these light mitigation policies. Yeah, and I think there's probably technical aspects that you can do um, or implement yes. for that it's not dark all the time. So as soon as somebody walks down a path, the light will turn on or something similar. That yes. So it's not that big of an issue. It's, it's a fear that we have probably, but it's as we probably would have heard about uh, major issues. Um, yes, and I also uh, put an emphasis on extinction, but other territories don't do total extinctions. It's just uh, sometimes it's uh, street by street. It's not the same policy on light, um, mm. depending on the, it's if, if it's in the center or if it's uh, like uh, passing. I'm sorry, <laughs> my poor English. <laughs> But uh, we don't have to extend to to do extensions. We can have other other actions. Like yes, I think Daniel is going to talk about it later. Then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you, Manon. Thank you very much for your contribution. It was super interesting, and I'm sure that we can uh, organize something together on uh, in the different countries and promote uh, more the work on what we're doing on uh, dark, dark skies um, and reduced light pollution um, to raise our voice and be louder together. So I'm sure that is, there's a lot of potential. And yeah, it's great to yes. see so many initiatives and an ongoing yes. discussion okay. on this. There are a few uh, questions for links for you in the chat. So maybe have a look there if you, uh, there's a lot of interest in, in your presentation. Um, yeah, and with that, thank you again, Manon, and I'm handing over to Daniel, who is a light pollution consultant or light technician in the Naturpark Ur. So he has more the technical knowledge on how actually implement light solutions in a municipality of a nature park. Um, and yeah, super interesting to hear his side of uh, yeah how to implement and reduce light in our surrounding. And yeah, with that, I'm handing over to Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, first challenge is sharing my screen. I hope it will work. Perfectly, go ahead. Yeah, it's just on the wrong page. Um, here we are. So, can everyone see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, why am I on the very first page of my presentation? You have to know um, I worked for the enemy. I worked for the lighting industry for more than 25 years. So I all I know all them hints and tricks. Um, I like that question about security. Um, you have to know it's much more like likely to be killed by your husband or your wife than on the open road. Um, statistics prove it. So it's always fantastic discussing about switching lights off during the night and people getting killed, cars stolen and so on. And believe me, it's not the case. So now that you know that I joined in from the from the enemy, um, I had the privilege joining Nature Park U about five years ago due to a program they joined called uh, the uh, Interact Europe Nightlight Program. So it's been a program of uh, different European regions um, about the topic of tackling light pollution. Um, they had a um, very great exchange between uh, these different regions. And um, yeah, Nature Park were discovered after one or two years that discussing with technical people on the same level is quite a challenge for people that are from the biological side. Um, and so they made um, a tender and looked for someone who could join in in the team. And it's been the most lucky choice I've ever made in my life, joining into the team of Nature Park. Um, so what have we done since then? Um, of course, sensitizing, sensitizing is a big topic. Um, if you just switch off lights or you are dimming lights or whatever, if you are touching lighting installations, people are always screaming because Luxembourgish people don't like changes. So you have to sensitize them. You have to explain why. Why are we doing this? Why are we switching from uh, metal halide lamps to LEDs? Why are LEDs different? Why are we switching off diff uh, for different uh, night times? And so on. Um, you have to know that people in Luxembourg have a lot of money to spend. So they're building castles and they are buying a lot or wasting a lot of energy. Um, educating them in using less energy is quite difficult. Um, so you have really to invest a lot of time into sensitizing. So we did this with a festival called Nightlight and More. And we uh, installed an old sky camera, which, of which you see a picture here, and you see the, the light pollution on the horizon. Um, for example, there's uh, on the at twelve o'clock from what you see, it's Luxembourg City. At eight o'clock, you see um, waste uh, com a waste uh, company, and it's uh, in the middle of the night, three o'clock, and all public lighting has been switched off during that moment. So all the light you see is private lighting. There's no public lighting at all on this picture, and so you see where the problem is coming from. It's not just public lighting, it's private lighting as well. Um, so we have done a lot of uh, aware raising activities. And of course, we were developing a monitoring program for the impacts of the climate uh, of the uh, climate change. And of course, um, with my um, work as a light advisor for municipalities, uh, businesses and residents, um, I work out, for example, taxes for tender specifications, which I've done three this month um, for city councils, for example. So we are changing thousands of street lightings. And uh, I've done one for a uh, football ground. And on the other side, I am on the field controlling if the uh, contractor has really installed what we were asking for. And uh, more than once, I have to say, the contractor screwed up. Um, even yesterday, I was on the field controlling for one of our uh, city councils the um, the material, and yeah, what should I say? The contractor screwed that much up that I think he just wanted to take a lot of money for not much work. 
My slogan is illuminating what's needed, how it's needed, when it's needed. So we have um, specification standards that we have to adopt for security of work, security of street lighting, and so on. But as LED is providing a lot of cheap lighting, instead of diminishing the, um, the installed power, we keep using the same power and we are uh, illuminating much more. Um, when I see lighting um, calculations, photometric calculations, for example, for a city, um, I often have to say that where five flux would be absolutely enough, um, the contractor comes with propositions of about 25 lux, 30 lux. So over illuminating by five to six times, which is absolutely horrible. And um, if you have people in the commune, city council or in the business who do not know how to interpret a photometric calculation, it's very difficult to get the illumination you need to. So how it's needed. So you have to direct the light where it's needed. So you have a surface, you have to orientate it onto the surface and not into nature or uh, the sleeping rooms of people or even into their uh, um, yeah, garden. And then, of course, when it's needed, as Manon as well, we said, um, as nearly one hour of nightly switch off is equivalent to 8% on the energy uh, bill by year. So if you do it for six hours, you have indeed about 48, 50% on your energy bill that uh, diminishes. On what am I working from the technical side? Of course, first thing, it's the light intensity, as I said. So if you have standards, I have to apply those standards, but I'm not over lighting the whole thing. Um, I have the radiation geometry, so I try to have the light directed into onto the surface that I have to illuminate and not anywhere else. I'm working with the color temperature and the blue component. So um, many of you have heard about color temperature. The higher it is, more blue component is in it. And so, of course, we try to adapt some warmer light have 3000 Kelvin or even less, 2200 or even less than that with amber light and so on. And of course, I'm working, as I already mentioned, on the switch off and on times. So really try to work with some movement detectors, uh, movement sensors and so on in order to have this just a operating lighting fixture when light is actually needed. And have a look. The same parameters have an influence on the energy consumption. And that's what I have problems to understand. Businesses are lighting even more. It's like a competition between service stations, between uh, supermarkets and so on. They, they grow light, uh, brighter and brighter, but of course they have an influence on the energy consumption. So I, I don't understand why they're increasing the energy bill if they would illuminate how it's needed, they would even gain money in the end. As I say, apply lighting standards, but do not exceed them. For God's sake, why do we have those standards? Standards were... Who, who's writing the standards? It's the lighting industry. So if you have already a standard written by the lighting industry, you can be sure that it's made for selling lighting fixtures. So we certainly do not have to exceed them. As I said, limit your radiation to the usable area. So you have a surface you have to illuminate, illuminate it, please. But leave me alone because I'm not on your surface. And, and don't uh, radiate on the... Um, into the garden of the neighbor, for example, or into forests, woods, and so on. As I said, use warm white color temperatures, maybe 3000 Kelvin or less, and limit the switch on or switch off times um, as needed. 
practical example, Pitchite. I've written a tender about uh, three, four years ago for Pitchite. So we uh, made a renovation of all of the public lighting. And um, yeah, I made it, as I said, uh, illuminating what's needed, when it's needing and how it's needed. Um, so Pitchite will be the very first uh, commune on the territory of Luxembourg that will have a complete public lighting uh, controlled by sensor motion. For you to know, Pütscheid is a very small commune situated in the north of Luxembourg, into the in the boundaries of uh, Nature Park Ur. Um, it's a commune which I like very much uh, working with because they are open for any stupid idea. So if, whenever you have an idea, they will be eyeing it. So in 2022, we made an introduction of a night switch off, which is between one in the morning and 4.30. Um, we had of about 100 city uh, communes in the territory of Luxembourg. We had about 42 interested into the introduction of night switch off. And nowadays, 14 communes are left that still have the night switch off because all the other ones due to people or inhabitants that um, wanted the lights uh, turned on back again, um, yeah, made a step back. Unfortunately, we don't have the same um, laissez-faire as the French, because I know in France we have a lot of nightly switch off and it, people love it. Um, in Luxembourg, we have to protect all those castles built by the people. Um, because they, they they think that burglars would come in the middle of the night when somebody's home, even though any statistics you read is that uh, burglars try to avoid the inhabitants at any time. This is the tender I've written in 2022. So we made a complete renovation of public lighting. Uh, it's been a joint tender with the neighbor commune, Park Hosingen, and um, we've done all of our new lighting in 2200 Kelvin, so really warm white, and all the luminous were equipped with Zaga interfaces enabling us uh, to implement now the sensor motion and the intelligent uh, lighting. As I already spoken about sensitization is, um, yeah, we do regular night walks um, on the topics of energy, light biology and astronomy. So usually I have about 20, 25 people joining in. Uh, we make a walk of about five kilometers. It takes two hours, two hours and a half. We start at uh, at sunset um, when the night starts, and um, yeah, usually when there's no moon on the um, on the firmament, so we can observe the uh, stars. This is the pilot project I've written, as I mentioned before already, the uh, light on demand. Um, so we have um, money from the state that has been given us uh, in order to implement these, all these motion sensors and the intelligent lighting on the whole territory of the uh, commune of Pütscheid, as it will be the very first uh, commune in Luxembourg that will have it on the complete of their territory. We have other uh, communes trying all these techniques. And um, but I think that Pitchite will be the one with the most points controlled, exception, of course, Luxembourg City. They have already about 1,500 intelligent uh, lighting points, but they are not uh, controlled by sensor motion. Um, yeah, then citizen science project. So I've, I bought a lot of uh, SQM, high quality meters. And um, I distributed them on the into the in the city uh, one two three in the commune of Pütschent. Um So by WhatsApp we have a group, and when it's worth uh, taking measures outside, well we get up in the middle of the night, and my colleagues are then doing some measures uh, all over the territory of the city uh, of the commune of Pütschent in order to know what's the uh, sky quality indeed. About a fortnight ago, we had a nice symposium on the topic uh, of tackling light pollution called Respect the Night. 
We had about 120 participants from all over the country and even from uh, Germany, France and Belgium. And um, yeah, we were, the idea was because the government changed about a year ago in Luxembourg and the topic of light pollution has uh, lost some interest was to spark again uh, the interest of the people. And of and indeed we had uh, uh, the written press and even uh, Luxembourgish television there in the evening and uh, a day later we were on the, uh, in the news. So once again, we could uh, spark again the interest into the into the topic. Uh, another project I'm writing for Pütscheid is a Stargazer place, um, which I copied a bit from our colleagues from Germany in Wurm, where we visited this and um, we found that a very nice idea into, for sensitizing people for the beauty of the night sky. Um, and I'm still waiting for some um, return from, uh, from the department uh, of um, uh, of the environment department in order to have some uh, subsidiary money for that. We are actually working as well on the nomination for International Dark Sky Association with the help of Andrea Senel. We try to finish it by the end of the year so um, that hopefully we can have the very first uh, Stere Park called in Luxembourg -ish. so a star place in Luxembourg where we could um, yeah, as I say, uh, hopefully watch the, the stars and have um, another attraction in the north of Luxembourg for the um, tourism, where we can attract people that are in, uh, interested in, the, in nature. That's the end of the presentation. I'm open to any questions. Up to you. Thank you, Daniel. Very interesting. And good luck with the uh, application. I hope it goes through. There was a question on if you have any study or evidence that talks about energy saved for each hour uh, the lights are turned off. Like a study that you can recommend or even if you know some. Uh, oh, that's very numbers. easy. <laughs> that, that's very easy because I used to work for the uh, network, uh, for the grid operator and the grid operator is the one uh, who's switching on and off lights here in Luxembourg. So I asked my uh, my ex-colleagues in order to have um, the times of every switch on and every switch off and so I put that into an excel sheet and so I have for every hour for every month I can tell you during this month we have uh, so much functioning time and adding up gives me about 4,200 hours that public lighting is, uh, is switched on. So I have a simple Excel sheet, which I can share if you want. Yeah, it could be interesting to see how this is monitored yeah. and the numbers. And do you know, um, yeah, you, you're saying it saves a lot of money for, com for companies or businesses um, if they would turn off the lights or reduce the lightning. Um, is this are these calculations being made also like you could save xyz thousands euro every month um if you use this a specific type or timing of lightning well unfortunately my experience is that reaching out for businesses is very very difficult so it's not done with just one mail or one phone call you have to stalk them for several months in order to get an appointment once you got your appointment you're on the winner's side because usually people don't know what you're talking about. And when you mention ah, energy saving, money saving, and of course, then protecting the environment, you've got them on your side. But getting the appointment is a hell of a job. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. But yeah, it, it leads again to that uh, raising awareness topic. <laughs> it should be also in our target uh, group and yeah, to, to get their attention on this topic, especially since it has benefits for them as well. Um, I'm not sure if there are other questions in the chat. Let me just check. Mm. 
there was a question on not specifically for you, but maybe you know as well uh, what equipment is uh, what equipment can be used to monitor light pollution. Mm. We have a lot. Um, mm. We have satellites. We can use the old sky camera. You can fly with drones over a specified area. There are different possibilities depending on how the re resolution should be. And then you measure the darkness, the level of darkness of the image, or how do you, what is the, what do you actually measure? Well, we have a, a very nice study from Lukas Schuller in, uh, in Switz from Dark Sky, Switzerland, uh, who's flown with his drone all over the north of Luxembourg, not just uh, over of Luxembourg. So he's having a, a specific light he's, uh, he's placing on the, um, he's placing down and then flying with the drone all over the area. And due to this specific light he has, he knows how the, um how bright that specific light is and so can extrapolate onto the other surfaces how bright them are mm -hmm. and then as we know where are the well the the most polluted areas you know usually you know who's a polluter and then you try to get an appointment but as i mm -hmm. said that's that's a hell of a job mm -hmm. uh, well yeah it's the chat is super active, but I don't see any other questions. Uh, if so, please feel free to still post them in the chat. Um, otherwise, Daniel, you, yeah, you can have a look at the chat and see if if you can reply to some of these comments there. And yeah, with that, thank you again for your contribution. And again, good luck for the application. So, and it sounds like you have a very interesting job. <laughs> and a nice place to work. Um, and yeah, exciting to hear from uh, Jean-Francois about the certification of dark sky parks. So we're getting a bit more formal now and see what are the benefits that we can actually get from a certification and how to do that. And yeah, with that, I think I can already hand over to Jean-Francois. He's yes. a delegate of the Dark Sky International and co-founder of the Dark Sky France chapter. So, yeah, welcome, uh, Jean-François. I'm handing over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Marit. Hello, everyone. I just share my screen. Is it OK? All good. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, to this webinar. My name is Jean-François Graffin. I'm astrophotographer. I make the, the kind of photography you can see here in the in the background. And I'm, I'm uh, also an astronomer. And I'm here as a Dark Sky International Delegate and co-founder of the Dark Sky France chapter, the antenna of Dark Sky International in France. And I wanted to talk about the certifications program of Dark Sky International because it's a tool that has developed strongly among natural parks around the world in the recent years. And that is very well recognized when we talk about protecting the night and raising awareness about uh, light pollution. And some of you may already know this program, thanks to parks and natural places that has been certified by, by Dark Sky International in Europe this last decade, as uh, Christian mentioned it uh, in, the, in the presentation in the introduction. So just a quick presentation of Dark Sky to begin. Dark Sky International is an association that exists since uh, 1988. Its former name was the International Dark Sky Association until last year, so they just changed uh, the name of the, the association. But uh, the mission is the same. Its mission is to restore the nighttime environment and protect communities from the harmful effects of light pollution for outreach, advocacy, and conservation. Dark Sky is based in Tucson, Arizona, in USA, and there is about 15 persons working there. There's also international committees regrouping experts from all around the world, 
and there's also local groups called chapters, as some already exist in several countries in Europe, in Germany, Italy, uh, Ireland, UK, Switzerland, the Czech Republic. There's a lot of chapters. And since only this year, there's a new chapter in Europe. It's uh, Dark Sky France. So we have a brand new chapter in, uh, in Europe. And so one of the principal actions created by Dark Sky International is the International Dark Sky Places Program. This program certifies communities, parks, and protected areas in the world that preserve and protect dark sites. This certification process is modeled on other conservation and environmental certification programs, such as the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, uh, sites and Biosphere Reserves. It's, in fact, it's the same philosophy. So similarly, uh, this program functions more as an award and provides international recognition for the applicant's efforts. So briefly, in history, af after some certifications of dark sky cities in Arizona, uh, so there was uh, Flagstaff and Tucson, thanks to regulations and uh, effective public policies on light pollution. The first two natural sites that has been officially certified in 2007 are the Natural Bridge National Park in USA and the Mont Mégantic Reserve in Quebec, Canada. And about Mont Mégantic, it's very inter interesting because this case was what um, inspired and permit Dark Sky International to create the guidelines, the guidelines for the Dark Sky Reserve certification. This was the beta project, if, uh, if I can say. Since there was a real increase of certifications showing the popularity of this kind of program. So here you, you don't have only dark sky certifications uh, in, this, uh, in the numbers, but dark sky certifications are, I think, the most popular uh, in the world uh, at the moment. So here you can see clearly the trend. And today, there's more than 200 certified places from Dark Sky International in the world. So as you can see, it's a conservation program that serves to encourage communities, parks, and protected areas to preserve and protect dark sites with 4K actions, lighting policy, dark sky-friendly retrofits, outreach and education, and monitoring the night sky. So here we, we recognize that the night sky is a natural, cultural, and historic resource that we need to protect for future generations, as also the International Union of Conservation of Nature recognizes it. However, the presence of growing and global threat of light pollution poses a risk of losing this resource if we do not invest in action to save it. And um, I could add that um, when we talk about resource, of course, there's more than the uh, usefulness notion of uh, this term, because it's also about a contemplative, philosophical, and poetic way of being to restore connect connectedness with the sky as well as with nature. So what are these certifications? They are of two kinds. You have a conservation approach with sanctuary, reserve, and parks. These dark areas provide visitors access to a natural nighttime environment. And the typical conditions of this kind of site are the Milky Way is clearly visible to a naked eye. There are no nearby artificial light sources producing significant glare. And any light domes present are dim, restricted in extent, and close to the horizon. And there's also labels to encourage actions in urban environment, like urban, uh, urban places and communities. So these sites do not provide dark skies, but they can provide nighttime experiences thanks to the use of effective lighting policies, as Daniel mentioned it uh, in his uh, presentation. So I will not talk more about these last ones, uh, and I'm going to detail the 
conservation approach. The last label, lodging, is very new and is about uh, accommodations with good lighting pr practices. So to go in the details, I wanted to present this graphic in order to figure out the logic of these certifications depending on the place you want to certify. So here on the left of the graphic, for communities or populated places, you can go to the dark sky community label. On the right, if you are identified as a park or a protected area, first you need to check what is the quality of your night sky. So you can quantify it with specific tools, uh, like uh, sky, uh, sky quality meters that measure the darkness of your, of your sky. Here, with the value of 21.2 magnitudes per arc seconds at the zenith, uh, it corresponds to a very beautiful night sky without clouds, of course, without the, the moonlight, uh, where you can see hundreds of stars. Uh, you, you have the Milky Way easily visible and a natural darkness. So if you don't have this quality, on the right, that's of course because there is an amount of light pollution. So you're in, a, in an urban area. In this case, if you are within a large city or a large urban area, you can go for urban night sky place. And on the, le on the left, that's because you have uh, the required uh, quality of the night sky, you have very good quality. So the specification depends here on the management of a site. When the area contains several administrators and or communities, you can go for the dark sky reserve. And if there is only one administrator, you can go for the park or the sanctuary. The sanctuary having an even better sky quality and is a, um, the sanctuary is also a remote location with limited or no staff capacity. So here are some specifications for these three certi certifications, sanctuary, reserve, and park. In all these three cases, it's a public or private land that has an excep exceptional quality of starry nights and a nocturnal environment that is protected, protected for its scientific, natural, or edu educational value, its cultural heritage and or public enjoyment. As I said before, the sanctuary has the particularity to be a remote location. There is 22 sanctuaries in the world, two in Europe, in Wales, and uh, recently in Scotland. The reserve is a very particular engagement and a more complex certification, I can say, because uh, of this particularity to have more than one administrator. So you need to create a partnership for a long-term planning. It concerns a territory of at least 700 square kilometers, and it consists of two regions. You have a core area meeting the minimum criteria for sky quality and natural darkness, and a peripheral area that supports dark sky values in the core and receives similar benefits. There is 22 reserves in the world, 15 in Europe and five in France and only two in USA. So with the reserve, you can see that uh, certification can be very popular in some countries because 70% of the reserves created are in Europe and almost a quarter are in, are in France because the, the, uh, the policy of natural parks corresponds very well to the specification of the dark sky reserve. And for the park, very quickly, I'll say that it's a more simple certification than the reserve with only one administrator, but with the same um, demand on the quality of the sky and its protection. And you can see it suits very well to the natural parks in USA because almost uh, eight of 10 uh, parks are in the, in the USA. So all these certifications imply to create a light, light management plant, plan on the territory 
and also to have the possibility for the public, public to have access and, and enjoy the beauty of the night sky of the site. So to proceed for an application, you can reach Dark Sky International or, like, or a local chapter as well. Just to show you the process without going into details, here you can see the three phases with the initial inquiry for reviewing eligibility and notifying your intent to pursue the, the application. The longest phase is, of course, the formal application, where, where all the work is done for the conformity of a site with the help from Dark Sky staff. So, so here you make the sky quality um, uh, uh, measurement. You, you need to check all the luminosity points of your territory. You must uh, make a management plan of the lighting. Uh, you must, must make also um, a map of the light pollution of the territory. All these kind of, uh, of things. And of, of course, also uh, sensitiv sensitizing the population, the citizens of the territory and the representatives. And at the end, finally, the certification phase, where the application is reviewed by the, by the Dark Sky Places Committee experts and approved most of the time. So here I will present uh, a little bit the example of what is working in France. With that particularity, as I said before, that we have only Dark Sky reserves in France. Here are the five international dark sky reserves of France. And there are at least five other projects, more or less advanced, uh, with one at the end of the process. So we could have a sixth reserve uh, uh, before the end of the year. Globally, it reflects that there, there's a great engagement in France on the topic of light pollution, from both uh, an astronomical and uh, environmental point of view. Numerous natural parks work since a long time on, to, on what is called dark corridors for night species without searching for a, for a label. There's a lot of associations and events that are involved in raising awareness on the subject, as Manon has presented uh, you before uh, with the Jour de la Nuit, which is a major event in France. And there's other organizations that have worked to reinforce lighting regulations since uh, several years. And among all of this, the International Dark Sky Reserve Certification is known as um, a high quality label that brings recognition for the efforts accomplished by the certified territory, encouraging the sustainability of the conservation actions already undertaken. And we, as Dark, Dark Sky France, uh, as this brand new chapter, we are emerging since only a few months, also to support this engagement from the Dark Sky Reserves. So thanks to all of that, we have good results in France uh, with the light radiation level that has decreased by 25% these last years, which is the best ratio in the world. But we know we can go further with, for instance, a work on how we can preserve biodiversity, not only at the earth of the night when there is extinctions, but also at the beginning and the end of the night when species are more active and light pollution has more effects on them. That's the kind of work that can be done inside dark sky reserves. And so, thanks to the public recognition of the dark sky reserve, there's an engagement of territories for obtaining the certification because they know they will, there will be benefits. That's a conservation project based on the valorization of nocturnal celestial landscapes and their protection through a program of conservation of artificial lighting. And the project, uh, the protected uh, dark sky area can become a resource for creating and developing local and touristic activities inside and outside the perimeter of the protected land. So to conclude, uh, here are some achievements for, from the, the dark sky reserves. 
raising awareness and honor public or private lands and surrounding communities for their commitment in night, time, night sky preservation, promoting eco and astrotourism, public enjoyment of the night sky, to promote protection and of nocturnal habitats and encourage studies uh, and scientific monitoring. For instance, there is scientific work about fireflies in the Mercantour Alpes d'Azur dark sky reserve, but Manon already uh, talked, uh, talked uh, earlier about the, uh, this uh, scientific monitoring. And uh, one of our achievements is to encourage land administrators, surrounding communities, and private private interest to identify dark skies as a valuable a valuable resource in need of proactive protection. And for example, the uh, the dark sky uh, reserve of uh, Parc National des Cévennes has worked with six surrounding large cities. The biggest is Montpellier, about a half million residents, to create an official engagement from these cities on light pollution. So, uh, as you may see, it it, uh, it extends outside the boundaries of the dark sky reserve. And on the other side, there's also difficulties. The most uh, difficult part is to work uh, on private lighting. It's uh, really not easy, as Daniel uh, already uh, talked about it. As a reserve is a partnership, there can be difficulties on, in the leadership, particularly when the leading persons are changing, then the approach can also change. And this can also bring difficulties on the long-term monitoring. And there's not yet an official recognition of this certification by authorities and institutions, uh, at least in France. I don't know if uh, in Europe, in other places, in other countries, there's a, um, a recognition of this certification. But in France, we, we would like to work uh, of, um, on uh, uh, this recognition by, by the authorities. So here, this is the, the end of, um, of my presentation of this overview of the Dark Sky International Certification Program. You can find more information on darksky.org and on websites of local chapters in some countries of Europe, like Dark Sky France. So thank you very much. And uh, of course, if you have uh, some questions, uh, um, I can, uh, if I can uh, respond, <laughs> I will be glad, uh, glad to respond. Thank you very much. And yeah, I was just wondering if there is, um, or there are probably guidelines um, online of how to reduce lightning or what you need to fulfill in order to hand in an application. So all of this information yes. is probably available. Yes, it's available available on the darkscribe.org website. You can have uh, some summaries, but uh, also you have uh, uh, complete gui guidelines. So it's uh, a PDF of uh, perhaps uh, 20 pages with all the procedure uh, to apply a certification. And it's also in different languages then, if you go to the specific chapter of Perhaps in yes, uh, in France I began to uh, to make a translation, uh, of course. But uh, from Darkscad International, it's in English. But I think mm -hmm. in other websites uh, from the chapters, you can have uh, uh, translation in foreign languages. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I really like that, and also the flowchart that you showed in the beginning is was very in, uh, easy to understand and follow. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't see any specific uh, question to you in the chat. Uh, maybe they're still coming in. Um, let me just quickly check. Um, ah, here. What is the benefit uh, to having a dark sky national chapter? Do you need many dark sky places in your country to make a chapter? How do you fund it? Uh, for a chapter, in fact, yes, it's a good question because it, it uh, emerged uh, so since only uh, one year, in fact, in France, it's because of uh, a general meeting of the Dark Sky Reserves that took place uh, last year in the Pic du Midi uh, Dark Sky Reserve. And it was because there was the, the need to have um, a local representation. 
just because if uh, dark cell reserves or if a natural park want to apply for a certification, there is no um, intermediary people. <laughs> and so uh, they had to uh, to check with uh, Dark Sky International in Tucson. So there's the boundary of the language and of course of the uh, of the uh, of the time, uh, so it's easier, of course, to have uh, people in France, um, in the country, in the local uh, uh, territory, to uh, to be able to to make the, the intermediary uh, work. So it's 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 a longer story in France because there was a former no. Um, um, another uh, association, and but uh, that was a kind of chapter, but not really. And so it's it's uh, there's there's a lot of things in France. But for instance, I know that there is a, a, a an association in Germany since perhaps twenty years or more uh, with Andreas Enel, and uh, they work with dark sky reserves and uh, dark sky certifications since a long time. So it's, it's a particular history in France, but in other countries, uh, so it can help to have uh, to, to, to have um, more accessible information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's I'm, I'm amazed by all the comments in the chat and all the links that are being shared. I think that's amazing. Different ideas from people and uh, I see that there's a common interest also to organize something together. Um, and I'll try to go through it later to take note of all the chaudenuis that are presented or that are taking place in different countries, initiatives, and yeah, to see and discuss at Europark what we can do to have maybe a joint mm -hmm. awareness raising initiative that can take place. Um, but it's really, really great to see all the amazing work that is happening on the different levels and what we can achieve together. Um, there was one comment and I wish to address that further maybe next time about health and how dark skies can benefit uh, yeah, the health of people and how yeah, how it's good for good for us as well as part being part of nature in that sense. And yeah, um, there's a lot to continue discussing on this topic. I'm very grateful for this, for the speakers today that you took the time to join us and to present the work that you are doing on the topic and also on all the comments in the chat. That is really great. And hopefully we can organize something together. And yeah, with that, we are also at the end of this webinar. So thank you again for coming and yeah, presenting and listening to the to the presenters. Um, thank you very much, and I wish you all a very nice rest of the week and rest of the day. And you will all receive a, an email with the recording, of course, and also also the presentations and the links that have been shared. <laughs>